Hey, welcome here. My name is John. I'm the Connections Pastor here at Village, and I'm so glad you're joining us. Uh, it's halfway through the month of January, and it's not too late to join in on our month of prayer. If you go to thisisvillagechurch.com slash prayer, you can get all the details, including this week's theme, that we're going to be praying together as a church. Again, that's thisisvillagechurch.com slash prayer. And as always, thank you for those of you who support us faithfully month in and month out. As we continue in what God is calling us to do this year, we just really appreciate the partnerships we have with you who give here at Village. If you'd like to join in in what God is doing, go to thisisvillagechurch.com slash give. And now let's hear from Pastor Michael as we jump back into our series on 2 Corinthians. Morning, everyone. How are we doing? We're good. We're good. We're good. Hey, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Hey, if you don't have a Bible, uh, every time you walk into any auditorium space, we have Bibles there for you. And it's important for you guys to have those because we love to go through this verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And so today we are in the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 1. And it's kind of an interesting passage because it's this bridge between two very famous passages on either side. And what we're going to feel is this like deep emotional pathos of Paul in and amidst this really awkward relational turmoil that he has with the church in Corinth. We all know relational turmoil, right? My wife and I had a brief time where we were not dating and, uh, and we played in this volleyball league that me and my friend put on and for some reason she showed up and she would bring her dad and I, I played college volleyball, so I knew how to hit a ball very hard. And I would hit her dad as hard as I possibly could <laughs> to let out my emotion. And in a moment of just quick-wittedness, he yelled out when I pegged him with a ball one time, I didn't break up with you, she did. <laughs> that one stung. It's awkward. You feel the tension between us. People would go, What's going on? And I would just say something as short as it's, it's a long story. Paul is feeling this kind of relational turmoil with the church in Corinth. There's tension and you can feel it through the passage as Paul is speaking. And it's something quite interesting when you begin to think about this. It's, it's the, the fact that the Corinthians are really disappointed in Paul. They feel like they're believing a lot of things that are not true about Paul. They've heard a lot of different things. There's, there's awkward comparisons towards Paul and other people that we're going to hear about in 2 Corinthians later. And what this passage is really trying to do is it's revealing the heart of Paul towards people who have been reconciled to God and reconciled with others, and yet they just will keep Paul at an arm's length and stonewall him from reconciliation between the two of them. So I want you to hear this as a longing of Paul's heart to be back in relationship with this church in Corinth, and it'll set a very different tone to the passage that we are about to read. We good? Okay, here we go. Chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, working together with him, uh, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in favorable time, I listen to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. So here we go. We have this uh, kind of interesting word. Uh, right before this, we get in this passage, we probably forgot. Paul has said, we have gone with the old, in with the new. You have a ministry of reconciliation where you reconcile others with God. And then he ends off with this triumphant, you know, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I in him can become the righteousness of God. So here's the flow of the argument. And all of a sudden he goes, now working together with him, being Christ, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God. The grace of God, it's the, it's the position that you as a follower of Jesus are not supposed to step one inch beyond. It's, it's to show you that you are always a monument of this grace. You are a sinner saved by this grace. That it's when you see Christ, he is the author and finisher of your faith. He is the first and the last. He is the alpha, the omega. He is the one who defines your very circumstance and who you are. And do not take this in vain. 
It has to affect you. It has to show itself in your life in a number of different ways. The grace of God has to be so tangible, so visible that the grace sweeps you up in a way that makes you more like him in the process. And Paul is saying the way that you are treating me is showing that something here is just a little bit off. What is that thing that is just a little bit off in your life? You know what God's calling you to. You know that you are defined by who he is, but something inside of you just doesn't want you to be consistent with maybe forgiving someone or reconciling with someone that you know you should and he's calling you to do it. Augustine said that a majority of the reason why he didn't follow Christ was not because of this great intellectual treaty in his mind. No, it was just pride. It's holding you back from the grace of God. These people won't reconcile with Paul. And the summary of this whole passage, when you think about it, is this. Paul is saying this. This is the whole passage. Don't shrink the effect of God's grace by staying alienated from me. Let God's grace make a difference in your life. Since now is the time of salvation, let it result in you opening your hearts to me. It's all he's trying to get across. Now, what's hard with a passage like this is uh, the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, okay? And I'll share this in a story. So uh, my mom, uh, I was going on a trip uh, in high school, and my mom, I said, we have to pay this amount. She said, how much is the amount? And I'm a teenager, so I don't know anything. I'm like, I don't know. So my mom, in just pure, just trust in me, gave me a blank check. And I was walking in Wally. As a 15-year-old kid, just walking, da, 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 right, walking, 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 and walking. I get to school, and I'm supposed to go to the PE teacher and give him this check and write the amount, whatever. No check. Where'd it go? I don't know. I don't know where the check went. It just disappeared. It was like I got pickpocketed, like an Italian pickpocket, but it was in Wally. So it was a wally pickpocket. And, man, my mom was mad. Uh, there's a, a fear that we have in Latin households. We call it la chancleta. It's when my mom takes off the sandal and it's, oh, you are the closest to death you've ever been. Forgiveness is my mom saying, hey, it's okay. I know you made a mistake. And somebody did like cash like $1,000 on that check. My bad. Forgiveness. Which means she's not going to hold that wrong over me. But reconciliation is not the same thing. Forgiveness is not to hold a wrong over someone, but reconciliation is bringing the relationship back or to a similar place before the wrong occurred. They're not the same thing. What Paul is not asking for is just only forgiveness. He wants to be reconciled with these Corinthians, and there is something about this church that is holding them back. Maybe some of you are in this situation. You've made a mistake. You've done a wrong to someone, and all desperately in your heart, you just want to be back in relationship with them. They are holding you at an arm's distance. If you have ever been in that situation, you know how Paul is feeling. I spoke at a camp once, and there was an older gentleman, had to have been in his 80s. And uh, he was talking to me. He used to be a uh, fire department chief in Ontario. And we're talking, we're talking, and after one of my messages, uh, he, like, confided in me. We're sitting down on this bench, and he said, uh, I've been estranged from my son for many years because of a number of wrongs that I've done. And year after year after year, I send my grandchildren Christmas gifts. And year after year, they just get returned back to me. I've longed to be with them, and they will not let me in. He went on to tell me a story about how he was playing a hockey game with a number of uh, fire department individuals, firefighters is what they're called, and police officers. He's playing this hockey game. In the middle of the game, he had a cardiac arrest and hit the ground. Luckily, everyone at that game was trained in first aid, which is like, that's a good place if it's ever going to happen, right? And he says he's lying there looking at his last moments, and the only thought that he could have is of his son. Now, obviously, the story ends up with him, you know, being alive and telling me that story. But I want you to have that feeling. The last person you want to be reconciled with. The last moments of your life, you're thinking about that kid of yours. That's what Paul is feeling towards this church. It is deeply, deeply, deeply emotional. To long for reconciliation and not to have it. That's what Paul is looking for. 
So he quotes in verse two, for he says, in a favorable time, I'll listen to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Uh, and then it goes here in verse uh, two. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So at this point, what Paul is trying to say is he quotes from Isaiah, and he's, he's trying to add a little bit of pressure under this like reconciliation thing that they have going on here. And uh, I remember in high school, I had a friend, his name was Lucas, and we were talking about church or whatever, and he just said, he said to me one time in a kind of an uh, interesting way, he just said, yeah, one day I guess I'll find myself in church, but just not, not now. Maybe some of us have had friends like that, or maybe we are the friend like that, who have said, yeah, yeah, I'll take those like spiritual things seriously, but just not yet. Augustine has a very famous quote where he said, God, make me pure, but not yet. It's a lack of urgency. Ah, it's going to come. Oh, I'll figure it out later, right? I'll figure out later did not work with diets. It doesn't work with taking away any bad habits. I'll figure it out later. No, no, no. The reason that you have to overcome some of those things is when you take advantage of the thing now. Your life and forever is just composed of an infinite amount of nows. Now. You have to figure it out now. There's an urgency of the soul because tomorrow is not promised for you. We've said this constantly for years and years of this church. There are people who are walking on the streets of this city and across this nation who are dying and going to hell. And it's not a, oh, I'll figure it out later. No, it's now. Amen. Now we have to do something. There's an urgency of our soul. There's a, a famous pastor who at one time was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And uh, he had brain cancer. He's up in front of a conference and he has a scar in his head and he has these lasting effects of brain cancer. And he looked at everybody in the room and he said, you know, we're all in the same position. I have brain cancer, you don't, but none of us are promised tomorrow. The only difference between me and you is every single day I'm aware of it and you are not. Now, there's an urgency so that stuff that you're putting away, those deep spiritual commitments that Christ has asked of you to do, do not put it off. It's now. And don't you realize the joys of what we have when Christ has given to us this, this, this now? It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing when we think about what Christ has given to us at this very moment. It has to have an effect on you. When you experience the love of God now, when you realize that you are the object of God's affection now, that we are members of his body now, that at this very moment, regardless of whether I'm feeling my lowest or my best, we are in union with him now. We have the security of Christ now, the assurance of Christ now, the authority of Christ now. We have God's inheritance now, God's discipline now. Right now, we have his power, riches, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. Do not leave that in vain. Amen. Figure it out. There's an urgency that this has to affect every place of your being. And in this place, it's saying the person that you have just said, I'll figure it out with them later. You figure it out now. Don't put off the lack of reconciliation that you know God is calling you to and say, I'll figure it out later. No, the time is now. But verse 3, he goes on and he wants to make a clarification on this statement. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Being a pastor is hard. It's hard. Because what you do personally some people take as what God says about them. One of my biggest fears is that my incompetence would be misunderstood as somehow God's opinion of you. People do that all the time. There's leadership issues all the time within churches. Uh, one major league athlete said, I, I know what it means to be a major league pitcher. I'm either in the penthouse or the outhouse. That's all it is. Sermons are kind of like that. I know you guys are on the ride home and you're like, oh, wish we had Finu. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, just relax. I'm not taking it seriously. He's handsome. I remember I was a young pastor, 18 years old. I did these sermons and they sucked. 
people loved Jesus less after I spoke these sermons. <laughs> and I would walk downstairs and there were these kids' rooms and at, the, at the church and I would just cry, feeling like I let everybody down. Being a pastor at times is feeling like you are not meeting the expectations of thousands or hundreds or tens. Everybody wants something from you, but you cannot keep this up. Is this uh, feeling that at times, especially after the pandemic, that it feels like we're doing a ministry to a parade. It's just different people making up this group. You never know who's really with you. It's hard. Now, this isn't me just griping about ministry. It is the greatest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. I've met some people along the way that, in the words of Hebrews, are not worthy for the earth. They're just amazing. The earth is not worthy of them. But it's difficult to have these expectations on you. For Paul to disappoint all of these people, to make them feel like he's lesser than or that other people are more important. At, the, at this moment, we're going to figure this out. There's this group called the Super Apostles. What a name, right? And the Corinthians like these super apostles. They're cool, they're charismatic, they're great leaders, they're eloquent, they know how to speak better, and they're handsome. You got Paul, who's like decrepit, small, bow-legged, has like a big, you know, whatever. He's just like, ah, he's like a gremlin guy. And they're basically just saying to Paul, I like him better. He's just better than you. It's hard to see people moving from one church to the other because of consumeristic things and, and not taking it personally, say that something about me. I'm not trying to, 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 to vent or anything. I'm just trying to put your mind into Paul's mind of what he's feeling. This isn't about the ministry. You know, some of the greatest pastors in the history of the world were tried to be kicked out of their own churches by congregants. People like the greatest theological mind, uh, Jonathan Edwards in New England, who led a revival in the East Coast, was kicked out of his own church by his own congregation. You know Chuck Swindoll, like the voice of all of our childhoods, right? Almost got ousted from his own church from people on the inside. It doesn't matter who you are. Ministry can be hard. And Paul is just trying to make the point that what is happening between us has nothing to do with ministry. It has something to do with us. It's much more personal than the job. And you see it in the way that he talks. It's actually quite beautiful. This next section in verse 4, he begins with nine hardships, continues with eight gifts and six conditions, and then concludes with seven contrasts. The hardships are presented in three triplets. The, grift, the gifts or graces are in the form of doublets. The six conditions are introduced with the Greek dia or through, and seven contrasts are preceded by the Greek hos or as. Why am I giving you these details? Well, the reason I'm giving you these details is because this is a very intricate way of structuring your opinion to other people. This is what he says. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. He's defending himself because it's not the ministry's fault. By great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities. So you have these different ways of, of, of synonyms for hardships. Beatings, imprisonments, riots. Uh, these are kind of the, the, the hardships at other people that have done to him. Uh, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. These are just um, the, the, the difficulties that go along with itinerant ministry. He's showing you the, the hardships, but he continues here in verse 6. By your purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed. Why do I read all of this for you? What's the point of me saying all of this? Paul is deeply embedded in an emotional situation with people who want to keep him at an arm's length distance. <clears throat> if that was me, I'd be popping off. You don't know me, right? I just get angry. There's lots of finger pointing, anger, I'm mad. Ah, right? Maybe that's your reaction to when somebody has something against you. It's just anger. You can't even control it. For other people, it's dismissal. Well, forget about you guys. I'll move on to the congregation that actually appreciates me. 
Why, why do I go through all the technicalities of this passage? Because what it means is it's not a venting of anger or frustration. It's a thought out and well laid out commendation of how much he is for them. Look at all the things that I've gone through to show you that I'm with you. Look at all the things that I have gone through in my life to show you that I'm with you. For some of us, that is some of the greatest things that you could ever have is just someone saying, I want to be with you. I've gone through everything. Beatings, hardships, calamities. People have, have hurt me. People have emotionally caused me trauma. And yet I do all of these things because I am for you. You don't even realize how much that means to someone who wants to be reconciled. I've, I've told this story many times. When I was a kid, my, my dad left our family. Uh, my, I remember seeing for the first time my birth certificate, and it says mom, and it has my mom's name, and it said dad, and it was a line. There's no dad. I was like, I'm, you know, there's no dad in this picture. Somebody else didn't have, anyways. Anyways, okay. It was a Jesus joke. I had to give away the joke because you guys didn't get it. <laughs> uh, I was probably 16, 17. I'm on Facebook. Somebody messages me and says, uh, I've been looking for you. This is why you never trust Facebook. <laughs> so I do what every, you know, confident young man does. And I go, mom, help me, right? Run over to my mom. She goes and it ends up being my uncle, my dad's brother. Long stories of events, I end up going down to meet this whole side of the family that I've never met before. I go to the airport, I'm 16 years old or whatever. My dad is in the airport, I don't even recognize him. He doesn't even say hi to me. We go off and we do all these things. This whole thing was this long plot by this family for me to meet the grandmother on that side. I go and I have this awkward interaction with my dad at a dinner. We go watch a Miami Heat game, which was sick. But the end of that trip, I said to myself, very simply, I just said, everybody else in that family has been reaching out to me. The only way that I'm going to have a relationship with my dad, 16 years old I said this, was if he is the one who reaches out. And decades later, it's never happened. That's what I mean. When someone who wants reconciliation, Paul, is showing you that he will go through anything to be with you, to be reconciled with you, now you know how much that means. Everything that I could have ever dealt with, I am for you. And he says such interesting, there's like a little tangent here that I think is so fascinating. When you think about doing ministry, you think about all the qualities or characteristics that makes a really good pastor or somebody who is in ministry. And we're all in ministry. You might think it's charisma, eloquence, speaking ability, leadership, business acumen. I don't know what you think about when you think of qualities of a leader, the things that make you do the greatest ministry of all time. Paul has two things, and it's not any of those things. For Paul, the two greatest things that you need for your ministry are this. Truthful speech, the power of God. Huh? That's it? How many of us think that, oh, I can't lead someone to the Lord because I don't know enough about the Bible? Truthful speech, power of God. You got that. And this first one's tough, hey? Truthful speech. Some of you like to lie. Right? You leave an event. I know this. In a Hispanic family, you leave a family event and you know there's going to be some hot gossip in the car ride home. Right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you see Patonia? Right? It's like, what's up? What? <laughs> some of you guys are way too comfortable with lies. And yet Paul said that one of the most meaningful things that you could have as a ministry is truth. And the question here is, are you going to allow truth to regulate your imagination or are you going to allow your imagination to regulate your truth? 
Don't you realize that worship, what we've just done and are going to do again, is just being moved by truth. That's what worship is. It's the natural human reaction to knowing the realities of who God is and his attributes towards you. You just can't help but just exalt him. That's what truth is. Truth is always the source. And modern people walking around downtown Vancouver with their like mocha latte things or whatever are hanging out, talking to each other about these spiritual realities where they all say, you got to go inwards. Where's your truth? It's, everything's just become subjective. And what this is saying is, no, no, no. It's not a subjective truth. It's objective. And you start with the objective reality, which is God. And that defines everything for you, not your opinion. Once you experience the ultimate, when you experience his goodness, experience his love, everything else pales in comparison and it acts as a filter for you to see how things really are. Truth matters. But it's not just intellect. It's moved by truth. Here's an example. Imagine a woman who's given a piece of jewelry from her mother. And she looks at it and she's like, oh, this is okay, whatever, wears it. It like fits like green dresses. So she only wears it with like green dresses, you know. She goes out to a function and one of her friends looks at this piece of jewelry and goes like, wow, that's pretty fancy. Like you should, you should go get that appraised or something. She's a contestant. I don't know if it's a contestant or a participant of Antiques Roadshow. She shows up and there's the guy, like the British guy's like, ooh, look at this piece of jewelry, you know, like whatever. <laughs> And she gives the piece of jewelry and gives it to the person. And, and the guy's like, puts it down like so lightly. And he's like, you don't know what you have. She's like, sorry? He's like, this, this is worth millions. And what happens? First, it's the emotion. What? I'm going to be Okay. My mom gave me this welling up tears. It's just the emotion. And then it's not just the emotion, it's, it's the action. Before she used to just grab it, throw it on the dresser, only wear it with the green dresses. It was like, but now her actions are completely different towards it. She knows where, she, where it is. It's safeguarded. She, she, she treats it with care and tenderness. All of her actions towards this are now different. But then it gives her this perspective. I can't believe, one, my mom gave me this. How loved am I? And two, I'm going to be okay. If the bills ever rack up, if I, if I don't have the finance, if I lose my job, I'm going to be okay. Moved by emotion. She's moved. It's not just an intellectual exercise. It is something that is experienced within the very core of who she is. And when you worship God, this is what you are doing. It is truthful speech that moves you into a direction of absolute worship. That's what you're called to go after with people. The anatomy of worship is truth catching fire being struck by how worthy God is and the value that he has in your life and giving him the value of his worth through your words. Truthful speech, the most important ministry that you can offer. Are you doing that? But it's not just truthful speech. It's also the power of God. All throughout the Bible, the power of God is synonymous with the spirit of God. Simon Ponsonby, he's a writer from Oxford, says this. It's the Holy Spirit and the immediate divine executive, the agent of God's will who weds the eternal son with mortal humanity. The creative spirit who hovered over creation overshadows Mary, creating, conceiving, and connecting God and blood, making out of Mary's matter what was not there before. The spirit performs a regenerative and recreative work. This new human life born of Mary is the old humanity from Adam's seed, which is joined to the eternal divinity of the Son by the action of the Spirit. Whenever Paul is ever introduced to any kind of hardship, and look at all of the hardship that he's been speaking about, what always balances out all of these difficulties that he has is the Holy Spirit. It's this balancing act. In my weakness and hardship, look at the empowering work of God's spirit in my life. This is the power. And to know this power, to experience this power, is to open up all of who you are to this Holy Spirit. All of your desires and all of your longings opened up to. It's like, it's like when you start dating someone. 
And pieces of you begin to just open up about yourself to this individual because you're trying to just like almost test them to see if they're going to give you what you need. You open up little pieces of your soul. You have this access when you open yourself up and you open up and you share, say it's your fears because you're looking for them to give you security. You share your aspirations, your hopes because you need dignity. You share your failures because you need someone to say, I will accept you. I need to share my confusion so somebody can guide me. I need to share my weaknesses so people can challenge me about where I'm weak and where I'm wrong. The deep level of relating, unless I'm sharing my fears and aspirations, unless I'm sharing my failures and my confusions and my weaknesses, I'm not being vulnerable to that person. And the presence of God is the same way. Are you going to open up or are you going to shut down? The power comes through presence. When we pray as a church, we're coming together because we want to be a church that has truthful speech and the power of God. This does not come through great logistics. This does not come through great patterns of worship or great guitar playing or any of the different things. This only happens, the great movement that we want across, the can- across all of Canada only happens if we declare his worthiness truthfully and we experience his power and his presence in a way that we are moved emotionally, we are moved in our actions, and we are moved into our perspective to say, he is going to do the work, can we tag along? This is what you and I are in for this. When we say we exist to see people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus, it means we are people who are going to speak the truths of who he is and how good he is, and we're going to know that he is leading us and guiding us to do the work to see people come to know him. That hell is vacant and heaven is full. That is what our job is. So when we show up to this place, it's not about what can you offer me. The question is, are we going to meet him? Are we going to meet him? Don't drive home and talk about just the little intricacies of that worship thing or that person speaking or I didn't like. Did you meet him? And if you do, everything else dissolves. That's what we long for, the power of God across our nation to rock the hearts of people that when we say this urgency, this now, the day of salvation, it does not matter how good this message is. It just matters of whether you showed up here ready and expectant to know that the God of the universe is ready in power to meet you. Are you going to open up? Or is all the things that are holding you back going to act as a wall to keep you as a barrier away from the living God who wants to be with you now? Paul is just longing over and over again to say, will you let me in? It's hard to do that. I'm not saying it's not difficult. Paul goes and he says in verse 10 here, the sorrowful yet always rejoicing is poor yet making many rich is having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you Corinthians. Look how crazy this is. Our heart is wide open. You know how easy it is to be cynical in church? You know how easy it is to just walk away from relationships or leadership or whatever it is because we become cynical in our hearts. Somebody hurts us and we close off. What Paul is saying to this church, he's saying, you believe lies about me. You are openly rejecting me everything I've ever done for you and you are turning away from me. And yet in the midst of all of that, he says, I'm going to allow myself to still be vulnerable to your hurt. Now this has to be nuanced. I'm not saying that every single person who's ever caused you the greatest trauma in your life is someone you have to open yourself up to. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you're holding someone in arm's distance, please carefully evaluate and audit whether it actually has to do with your pain, your trauma, and what's wise, or if it's your ego and your pride. That's what I'm saying. 
And for Paul to go to them, he's saying, I have not sinned against you. Yes, I've let you down, but I have not sinned against you, and I want to reconcile. Please, please, in your knowledge of who you are to God, allow me to come to you. How many of us have ever had someone hurt us and you just said, I will never do that again? I love how authors put this kind of feeling. One one author who I love reading says this, what happens when people open their hearts? Simply, they get better. Another writer says this, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they they are never weakness. And lastly, C.S. Lewis says at the very core of what it means to be a Christian is to love. Love. It's who you are. It's who God is. This is what he writes. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one. Not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Paul, our hearts are wide open. I'm not denying that this is hard to do. To open yourself up, to be hurt once again. And in wisdom and discernment, you carry that through with the Lord and with people who are around you. Don't do that for everyone. But if you are called to, you open yourself up again. And the only thing I can say is how grateful are we for the God of the universe to come down and take on flesh to say they've rejected me over and over and over again. If if God can explain his relationship with humanity, it is betrayal, it is backstabbing, it is turning around, it is a lack of desire for reconciliation. It's God saying, I just want to be with you, I want to be with you, and humanity has always said, no. That he would do everything, everything, everything to be with them. And the way that he shows it is with open arms on a cross, hung to a tree, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His heart is open towards you. His heart is open towards you. And now, now is the day of salvation. Father, we thank you for this time that as we sit here and as we think about the people in our own lives that we have a lack of reconciliation with or a lack of forgiveness to. We pray that it is your modeling, it's your posture, it's, it's, your, uh, it's our experience of you that will allow us to be moved in such a way that we see, God, you are the one who is the role model for how our faith is acted. That we would see these truths of who you are and it would move us emotionally. It would move us in all of our action. It would change our perspective and so we treat people differently. So the deep emotion of Paul is to say, I just want them back. And we just hear the echo of your own words to us. We just want you back. Father, we pray for those who have heard this message who are now just thinking to themselves, I gotta be serious about these kinds of actions in my life. That today is the day that I I, I put all of the things that I find important aside and I give myself to Jesus Christ. I pray that that would happen here in this room, Father. That you throw your weight around and you do the work. The power of God is present here and everywhere that sees this message. So Father, we thank you. We love you. And just want to pray. Amen. If you're able, please stand again as we continue to worship our God. Behold the one, the radiance, the splendor of every living thing. You are the word, you are the life, you are the face of God.
This act of love, this sacrifice, we see in the face of God.
Death cannot hold you, cause death could not. 